see you have made it here today because as always we have gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ glory be to God he is alive he lives and as always I believe it is by the power of God's good spirit he has drawn us together here today I truly pray and hope that you are blessed and are being blessed today have been going through this biblically-based 12-step program to bring recovery to folks like yourself who are seeking recovery, to be, to be made whole and to be well mentally, spiritually, and physically. That's the goal. And I believe recovery is possible for you. I believe this stuff works. <laughs> and uh, hang in there and, and trust in the process. We're working on step five, which is spiritual faithfulness. And faithfulness is the producing of stewardship. And our stewardship is trusting in the process of God. It may take time. It may take time, especially when we are under the influence of some sort of an addiction, which the addiction is a side effect that comes from being abused or exposed to a traumatic event somewhere in life, whether we're abused as children or even as uh, adults, you know, some of the side effects of, of being abused as children is some reason we, we gravitate towards abusive spouses. We, we engage in toxic relationships and uh, we need to, to just come back to God. Right? Again, some of the side effects that, that are happen in our lives when we're uh, suffering from PTSD is uh, the lack or the inability to be spiritually faithful or to even believe in, in the spiritual faithfulness of God. And sometimes that, that part, that peace within our life can be broken, can be fractured. Some can see it as that that piece was stolen from us and we're come to repair it. That that part in our life. So, so that we can walk in, in a way of, of recognizing and understanding our spiritual connection to God and the world. We are a part of God's divine plan and purpose. And in that plan and purpose, God desires to place within us a sense of joy. A sense of joy. One of the fruits of the Spirit is our joy. Another fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. Stewardship over the things God commands us. And so we wonder, you know, and we can look here in... Uh, Matthew chapters 23, as Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, religious leaders, the scribes, people who, who spend their lives, you know, remember back in those days, uh, they didn't have the printing machine. A scribe was somebody who sat back and uh, copied one of the scriptures to create more Bibles or more uh 
what do they call them? Scrolls. They, everything was written in a scroll back then. And so they'd create more scroll, scrolls and so the scribe what was the printing machine. And so they, they spent a lot of time reading the word and, uh, and they were in it, in the midst of it. And then you had the lawyers that were people who were responsible for the teachings and instructions of Moses and, and their inside of the law. <clears throat> you know, there, there's a sense of legalism. And so if we were God-governed, you, you have lawyers out there making sure everyone is following the letter of the law. And the Pharisees, again, were religious leaders uh, of that time. And so we, we wonder, what are we to be faithful with? And so we see right here of some of the things. And so what does he say? We should read through this. It says the scribes, and this is Matthew chapter 23. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe what they tell you. But not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They preach, but they do not practice. And, and so that's the definition of hypocrisy, right? I, I say one thing, and, and yet I do another. And, and so when we're talking about spiritual faithfulness, and our faithfulness is the stewardship of something, something God has given us, well, it, it's an action. It's an action. And it's not words. And, and that's something I struggle with and, and, you know, have been struggling with as a church here in a small community. And, and even though we're new to this community and strangers to this community, that the Christians within this community are, it seems to me that they lack the ability to practice what they preach. You know, it's, it's, it's all words and it all sounds great, especially when, when I'm speaking the words, but if, if I don't practice the words we preach, it isn't, it isn't going to work, and it doesn't mean anything. And it's for that reason Jesus Christ comes into the world. He is God in flesh, and so all the words spoken, you know, in the beginning it was the Word, and the Word was with God, and it was God. So back there in, in the days of Moses, we'll get back in, into the Exodus, because it, it's a great story about being faithful. And the restoration of faithfulness. We gotta remember those people were broken, those people were abused, and, and they were subject to a sense of slavery uh, from uh, an entity that was far more powerful than them, yet the, the, the power that entity had, Pharaoh and the Egyptians, it, was, it came from their mind. That they didn't have any power other than the power <coughs> they were willing to give them. And it's the same in our world today. It's the same in our world today. It's what are we, what are, what, why are we allowing this, this, the influence of this spirit? And again, and for us in our world, that that spirit is some sort of a spirit of addiction. Addiction from whatever it may be. We, we've kind of discussed that addiction is addiction. And being a slave to that uh, addiction. And, and we're trying to free ourselves from it. And so the only power it really has is, is the power we have surrendered to it. So 
So we don't want to be hypocrisy, full of hypocrisy. We see in Pharaoh and the Egyptians, lots of hypocrisy. Lots of hypocrisy. They say one thing and yet their actions absolutely support something else. And that's sometimes why we are stuck in a place of being unable to move forward in our recovery. We, we say, I, I want to be free from the slavery to sin, but none of my actions prove the desire for that freedom to be the truth. To be the truth. And so in all of that, we're, we're, we must be honest always. We, <clears throat> cannot engage or, or come into uh, the, the recovery, we can't be made whole if we're lying. If we're lying to ourselves and we're lying to God. We must come out of the denial. Denial. We gotta be honest and truthful. So let's look. And you know, when I, I say, you know, I, I struggle with the church right now. Some of the churches and the teachings that go on in church. Because a lot of the churches around, it's all about Jesus and forgiveness and oh, how great is it to be able to walk and live in grace and never address the issues. Never talk about problems. Have no desire to deal with or to engage in another person's problems. You know, that's the last thing we want to do. Especially when the person who has problems is, is standing in front of us, you know. We should love the stranger. We should love ourselves. We should always be hospitable to one another. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. I, you know, so, so what I'm trying to do is say, you know, I get it. I understand why or how or what it was that created you to find a, a lack of trust. And how convenient is it for us to, to not trust in the church or in this biblical teachings and, and thinking that, oh, I'm going to find recovery in the stuff, I get it of why we've lost trust. And you know, here at our Father's House of Prayer, I want you to know we are, we have nothing to do with being a non-profit organization. We, we don't have nothing to do with that. And the mismanagement of money and, and things coming in, you know, it's amazing, the church the Baptists, the, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the, these organized religions, they take in money and they take in lots of money, right? Tithes and offerings and, and gifts and donations and they take it in and they take it in and then at the end of it, they, it disappears at the end of the year because they, they, they see some thing of signing their rights, their liberties away to the devil, to the government, for the sake of being non-taxable. I don't want to pay my taxes, and I don't want to pay no taxes. And so we're a non-profit organization, and all the money that comes in goes somewhere, whether it goes to Africa, billions. If you go back years, past all the years, of all the money the Baptists have donated to Africa, all the money the Presbyterians have donated to Africa, all the money that the, the Methodists have sent around the world. 
you know, and yet they're, they're still swallowing around in the ooze and, and the gutter of, of nastiness. Give them billions and trillions of dollars and, and there's no evidence they've ever received a nickel. <laughs> And in all of it, when the people in front of you and the people in the pews, the people at the church have problems and issues, well, all of a sudden there's, there's no help for you. I don't got no money and I don't got no time. Here, here, the answer to your problems is prayer. You know, I tell you to tithe and do all these things and, and take care of me and make sure and ensure that my children go to college, and not just any college, but the best colleges in the world, and I, the preacher and the pastor, are making $100,000, $120,000 a year. But but the moment anyone comes with issues and problems, your, your problem is with God, it's not with me. And they won't lift one finger to help anyone out. And that's something here at our Father's House of Prayer. We, we want to put an end to that kind of hypocrisy. But I, I, I get it and I understand why you might be skeptical on finding help and recovery from places like this. But I want to ensure you that we offer this 12-step program free of charge. It's not about money. It's not about me being able to pay my bills even though it, I wished I could. To me, it, it's about you getting the recovery you so desire. That's important to me. Now, I want to reassure you of that. Your problems, your issues are important to me. And it's not only important important to God. It's important to Jesus Christ. And that's why I feel Christ has moved me to do this, to be a part of this. And there's many times when, when I can look at Moses and, and say, boy, Moses, I, I, I feel just like you. Why me? <laughs> why me? I'm inadequate. I'm not good in speech. I got an ugly smile. There should be a lot of other people you, you could have chosen to do the job, but nevertheless, I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to trust in the process. And I'm going to trust in the fact that God must know what he's doing when he chose me. That's something that we can learn from people in the Bible. They were regular, normal people just like you and I. Don't, don't put Moses on a pedestal or Elijah on a pedestal and Jeremiah up on a pedestal or even the apostles and the disciples on some sort of a pedestal thinking that, yeah, well, God did something great for them and through them because they were great people. They were, they were normal people just like us, just like you. And God can do something great through you and with you. He can redeem you. And you can experience something whole, a wholeness about yourself spiritually, physically, and, and mentally. But let's get back here. They do all their deeds to be seen by others for they make their phylacteries broad and their fingers long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others, which is teacher, right? So when are we learning a little bit about discernment? If we're gonna seek help, and we're seeking help from a viable source, <laughs> we've got to recognize and understand what we're looking at. What are people doing? 
you know, and you're probably not going to find help when somebody hands you a brochure and says, well, we offer Christian counseling, and, and then, you know, 75% of the brochure is about finances, about money, and how, how are you going to pay for this counseling? And when it's, a, it's all about the money, and it looks good and it sounds good, but I, I've noticed and see the, the investment that the person has, has delivered to me it is their interest in my money. That you, you probably won't go and find much healing or good from that source. It ain't gonna work too well for you. Because your issues aren't the problem or their desire. Keep that in mind. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man father on earth, for you all have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. Again, this is why we, we don't, we're not putting out anything about higher power. We're, we're not an AA, Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program. We're not a Narcotics Anonymous 12-step program. We're not a 12-step program of that sort. We are a biblically-based 12-step program. Our healing is gonna come from the one true God who is our Father. And all of our teachings and instructions come from Christ. And Christ is the living word. And even though when we're in there in the books of Moses and looking through the Torah, which is the five books of Moses, we're drawing out of it teachings and instructions that they're going to teach us and train us in a way of righteousness that are going to prepare us for a good work. And the good work we're seeking for, right, is recovery, recovery from the side effects uh, of the abuse. And some of the side effects are maybe um, depression. So the good work I'm, I'm seeking to achieve is the ability and the strength to be able to say to, to this, this entity, this spirit, let me go and, and to mean it. Let me go so I may go and worship my God. Saying to this addiction, let me go so that I may be able to worship my God freely with a, with a sober, sound thinking mind. It comes to the strength of the Holy Spirit. Right? We're talking spiritual faithfulness. This is at that point. If we're going to be a good steward with some of the commands of God, we should be baptized, and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, for, for the stoppage of it, for the forgiveness of it. Being able to forgive ourselves for listening to the lies of the devil. Being able to, to forgive ourselves for, for being in a place of weakness. You know, a, a lot, we can forgive others, but sometimes we really struggle to forgive ourselves, but we need the strength and we need the strength of the Holy Spirit. And so we get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, being fully immersed in Jesus Christ. And then that empowers us with the ability to, to receive the Holy Spirit, which empowers our faithfulness, our, our stewardship. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever calls himself or exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And, and sometimes in that humbling ourselves, but we come to this place where I, I, I'm worthy to pray for myself. 
And not only am I worthy to pray for myself, I'm worthy to ask others to pray for me as well. That's humbling ourselves. But to humble myself is to, is to say, I'm not okay, I'm struggling, I got issues, I got problems. And I need God, I need the strength of God to come into my life and to be able to help me. And so it, it being faithful is prayer and conversing and talking with God. So we see with Moses, even there in the book of Exodus, he, he begins, God begins strengthening Moses <clears throat> and Moses begins being faithful to God and, and it comes through the conversation they have with one another. Interacting with God while God is in your presence <laughs> and recognizing God is in your presence. So prayer is powerful and, and everything is done in prayer. And so that's, you know, instead of waking up in the morning and, and looking and searching for my cigarettes, I, I, I am focused on God starting my day with God, starting my day in prayer, and then walking out in the world and in life with God at my side. And that's what gives us the strength to walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, to, to stand in the presence of our enemies and yet not be afraid, have the strength to, to overcome our enemies, and our enemies are the addictions, our enemies are, are the little words that come in that say we don't matter, we're not good enough, don't even try, you're, you're not important enough, you know, the, the, those are giving us strength over that. We do matter, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so when we humble ourselves, and, and a lot of the humbling is saying, God, I need you. I need you. Moses says the same thing there in the book of Exodus. So I, I'm not a man of, of eloquent speech. How, how can I do this? How is any of this going to be done? Humbling himself and saying, God, I, I need you. And, and, and God humbling himself by exalting Moses and saying, well, just as much as you need me, I need you. And it's saying the same to us today, to you today. This world and the creation and everything in it through God's divine plan and purpose in creating it wouldn't be awesome, it wouldn't be beautiful if it was missing you. Understand that, recognize that. says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you set the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would go to go in. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single convert, and when he becomes a convert, you make him twice as much as the top child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you blind guides who say if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. So what are we being faithful with? Right? And, and Jesus saying it's not about the gift we bring. It's about you, the bearer of the gift. And that's what's important. And that's what Jesus is saying to these people, and the scribes and these Pharisees and the preachers of our day. The gold isn't important. The prosperity isn't important. I mean, so many preachers and teachers are preaching that, that, that we come to God for personal gain. You know, the, the one thing that's going to change our life is more money. More possessions, more stuff. But never recognizing and understanding 
the, the underlining thing in our lives is I got issues, I got problems, and I'm dealing with some real serious stuff. You're important. Not the money, not the possessions, not the things you're lacking in, 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 of this world in, in your life. You're important. Being faithful with the things God has given you. God has given you strength. Be faithful with that strength. And, and, and when I say that strength, the, the ability to come to him in prayer. Again, we're being faithful as he goes down and he talks to these Pharisees and saying, you know, we, you're always trying to wash the outside of the cup making and presenting that, that re being religious, being spiritually faithful is shown through the clothes we wear. This is stuff that Muslims teach. Their, their connection to God comes through their clothing. I am a respectful, honorable, religious person because of the things I wear. We see it in the Catholic religion with the popes and the cardinals the nuns, the priests, and their clothing. We, we see the same thing over there in uh, Amish, Mennonite communities. They provide and say, this is what makes us religious. This is what connects us to God. Look at our clothing. And it's all about the, the washing of the outside of the cup. You, you can always recognize Jewish folks, Orthodox Jewish folks, because of their clothing. And then Christ is saying it's not about the clothing, it's about the inside of the cup. Didn't God make the inside and the outside? And the, and the problem is, is why is nobody getting help? Why is nobody coming to the church and finding recovery and healing and redemption? Well, because the preachers and teachers are full of greed and selfishness. They don't want to deal with the issues going on in your heart. So I get it. And I understand your, your hesitation to not trust. I get it. We should be faithful with justice and mercy. And it's not about government justice. It's about the justice we produce for ourselves, the mercy I'm willing to allow myself to have. And sometimes, you know, am, am I worthy of the justice to be able to say to that foreign entity, no more, let me go. I'm not your slave, and I'm sick of being your slave, as we're speaking to an addiction. The mercy, saying to ourselves, that I deserve mercy. I deserve the goodness of God. Being faithful with the things God has given us. I want to now look back over here at uh, Exodus. And again, we see that the Pharaoh and the Egyptians are, are that of filled with, with hypocrisy, saying one thing and they do another. They're putting and placing on the people heavy burdens. We, we see it in the addictions, doing the same thing. The little voice that comes in, the devil's voice that tries to, to draw us and, and keep us bound the things we know are, are destroying us and the hypocrisy of it though every drug dealer you know says I, I, I love you I care about you I care about your problems and your issues and all the things that you, that have wounded you right and, and, and then they, they, they give you more drugs and, give you more alcohol. 
and that is a form of hypocrisy because the drugs, the alcohol, the addiction is breaking us down, it's tearing us down, it's destroying our relationships, it's destroying everything around us. So if we turn here now and, and one thing I want you to see and recognize here in, in the story of Exodus is when God and Moses and Aaron come and they begin to tell Pharaoh, we're going to let my people go. And Pharaoh responds with evil by saying, you know, we're, we're going to, you're going to make bricks, but, but you're going to make bricks without straw. And it's evil comes upon them, you know, and, and it becomes even a harder task, right? It, it, it's, our, our addiction is usually never a problem. It, it's bearable, even though it's like a giant burden on our back. It is bearable until we, we, we decide we, we, we don't want no more of it. And then... That it, it, it like you know really wants to grab hold of us. It really wants to not let go, and all of a sudden it becomes unbearable, and it becomes likened to an act of evil. And the thing I want you to see is God doesn't punish you because of this entity that is controlling over you. Instead, God is going to focus his power on the Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh. He's going to focus his power on the Egyptians. He's going to focus his power on the uh, addictions, proving to the addiction time and time again that you are a child of God and, and your protection, your strength, your essence comes from God. It's coming from God. So I want you to listen to this. Let's, uh, let us look at this a little bit. Chapter 6 of Exodus. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. And so when we say, by my name, the Lord, yod heh vav -He. That's the Hebrew letters of the Lord, and that's where we get that, is right here. And somewhere along the line, somebody said, well, we don't want to blaspheme the name of God, so we're going to change it to Lord or Anonai. I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. And I have remembered my covenant, my promise, my pledge made to Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob, that he would bless their descendants, that he would bless their seed, their children. He says this, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with the acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Again, sounds good, right? Nice story. Sounds good. 
but it's just a bunch of words. And so we got to be find a place within our lives. Faith leads to faithfulness. And, and again, what we're seeing, God and, 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 and Moses are, are conversing with one another. They're talking to one another. And, and God is, is displaying the fruits of the Spirit through Moses, with Moses, and displaying through the, his word that, that I am faithful. I'm a good steward to the things I spoke and have said. Spiritually faithful. God is spiritually faithful. And that all of this is available to us today. It just comes down to we believe it. And, and what prevents us from believing it? And he goes on to say... I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke this to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because their broken spirit and harsh slavery. You know, and, and that's something we got to recognize and, and understand that when, when Jesus came into the world, who did Jesus seek? Who was he seeking out? Who is, when Jesus came to the world, who was it he was seeking for? Right? And so we wonder, you know, in thousands upon thousands of years, Everybody's been proclaiming that, that Jesus Christ is coming and he'll be coming soon. And here we are 2,000 years later, the world sucks. It's all going to a disaster. My life sucks and, and it's a disaster. And where is God? But who did Jesus come into the world to find? Who did it? When he came into the world, what was he seeking for? The broken hearted and yet here you are today here you are and, and he, he proclaiming you are my people you are my daughter you are my son you are my people and I am the Lord your God and, and this is what Jesus, come, and I proclaim to you today that you will be recovered. You will be redeemed. You will be made whole. And you'll do that, and it'll be achievable, because God loves you. Because Jesus loves you. When Jesus came into the world seeking the brokenhearted, he found you. You were not forgotten, forsaken, left behind. He found you. And now we're going through the process of delivering you from out of the hand of slavery and that hand of slavery is seen in the form of addiction and, and, and let me tell you when, when they were dealing with Pharaoh and the Egyptians and, and we look back at, at the pyramids they built thousands of years later and we say whoa how did they move 2,000 pound rocks how did they move <clears throat> rocks that were 20 tons big 500 miles to, to create the pyramids. How'd they do it? I mean, you want to talk about, about an entity and a group of people that displayed enormous amounts of power. These people did it. And, and, and this is back in an ancient time. And here we are thousands of years later. And I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they did it. They, they, they must have had wisdom of the angels. God must have moved them rocks for them. Man couldn't have did it, and they couldn't have did it back there 20 
to whatever, six, eight thousand years ago, whenever it was. So, so they were displaying an enormous amount of power. And, and trust me, the people feared them. They feared them. And yet God was saying, you know, I raised up Egypt and I made Egypt so great. And the Egyptians of that time so great were thousands of years later in, in a state of awe over what they built and what they did. And he said, I, I raised them up so that when I delivered my children out of their hand, the world came to know the depths of my love and, and the depths of what I am willing to do when I crushed them. So <clears throat> here we are in our world and our thing, and I, I got an addiction, and yes, that addiction feels big. It feels powerful in, in the same way Pharaoh and, and their influence over the people of Israel felt big. It felt powerful. But there is nothing more powerful than God's promises, his word, or his love. Nothing more powerful than it. Nothing. Nothing. And your addiction is just a little tiny blip in the eyes of God. He will recover. God made these promises to you, to you. And, and he understands and recognizes, yeah, can't listen, can't even hear it because of a broken spirit, because of the harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of Egypt his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. The people of Israel wouldn't listen. As Moses is saying, just, just rise up, stand up, let's go. Let's get out of here. Follow me. No, if the people won't listen, now we're, we're going to turn our attention to Pharaoh himself. We're going to turn our attention to, to the addiction. We're going to turn our, our attention to the devil. And, and, and that's Christ and the faithfulness of Christ alive within us and is here today by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're not turning our focus on, on you and your inability or your weaknesses or, or the things you've done in your life that, that created the addiction, that, that, that's beside the point. What we want to look at it is we want to turn our focus to the addiction itself. We're going to display power to the addiction itself. We're going to display power to Pharaoh. Moses says, for I am uncircumcised in lips. Right? I'm not college educated. I didn't go to seminary school. Just a, a, a guy out in the middle of the wilderness who saw a burning bush and, and had an encounter and an experience with God. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh and the king of Egypt to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. These are the heads, and then he goes through and talks about some of the uh, mentions everybody by name and the numbers of the people, and they go through this like genealogy thing, and then what it is is God saying, they, they, "I know everyone, and I know everyone by name, and I know who they are, and I know who you are." I know you by name, you're important to me, and he's displaying a, a sense of importance uh, about these people. And then if we skip down to verse 28, chapter 6, 
On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. Moses said to the Lord, I am uncircumcised in lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. And you shall speak all that I command to you. And your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. And again, we're... we're we're not talking about Moses and Aaron. We're talking to God, our Father, and Jesus Christ, who empowers us with the strength and the words to say, and then how to do it and how to overcome it. So when we're being faithful, as Moses begins to display a sense of faithfulness, Aaron begins to display a sense of faithfulness. Even, even when I, I can't see the outcome, and I, it, this, I feel small, I feel weak, I am very vulnerable. How is this going to happen? God, be faithful with the process. And recognize and know that I am God and I know what I'm doing. Be faithful to the process. I will give you the strength to be able to stand against that foreign spirit, the addiction. I will give you the strength to stand up to it and to say to it, let me go. And I'll give you the strength and the ability to mean it. And when you mean it, when it's honest and it's the truth, it will begin to, to become powerless over your life. And sometimes it takes an act of humility and vulnerability to, to even say it out, and it helps. It really helps. If you were inside of a group setting, and you were with people and other people who had been abused and sharing their experiences of abuse and, and recovery and the process of recovery, and you're standing in the midst of it, and you're in the middle of it, and you, and you have the strength to stand up and say, I want out. I want out of the addiction. It's killing me. It's breaking me down. It's very powerful and empowering to stand up and say, I want to be better. I want to be better. And then as we manifest <coughs> <clears throat> those words out loud and share them with other people. It has a powerful effect on us. Because it slowly becomes a reality. It's no longer a thought or, or a wish or a desire. It's no longer things hoped for as things to be faithful with. It's the manifestation of God's power within you. I'm going to empower you with the action it takes to free you from the disease, from Pharaoh, from Egypt, from the addiction, from the depression. And this is what we're going to find is a lot of teachings and instructions in this that, that's going to build up our faith so that we could be faithful with the things God has given us with. Like one of the things that God says, I want you to be faithful with, right? He, he's creating a, a sense of faithfulness when he says, you know, this is the last sign. This is the last thing what we're going to give to Pharaoh. We're skipping ahead a little bit. This is the last thing. We're going to give to Pharaoh as a sign. And, and, when, and when this one comes about, he will absolutely lose all of his power. 
And he will relinquish his power and then restore to you your power, your free will, and your desire to worship God without fear, reproach, guilt, or shame. And it all came at that time. When he says to the people, okay, not now. Death is coming in. The angel of death, death is coming in and it's going to come into the community. And death has Pharaoh and the Egyptians on his mind. But I'm going to cover you in the blood of the Lamb. So just as he promised to Abraham and to Isaac, I will provide. I'll provide the lamb, and the lamb will give you the strength and the power to overcome your enemies, to overcome your, your addictions. And God gives them the instructions and stuff and, and everything about the sacrifice of the lamb and, ha and how that lamb had, had to be without blemish or spot. And in each family, had a lamb. And that's where I come in, that's where we come in, that's where preachers and people who truly care about your issues, truly care about your problems, truly want to see your recovery and redemption become manifested in your life. There are lambs given. Not everybody is a preacher, not everybody believes in Jesus Christ within our families and our friends or maybe even amongst our spouses, but one of us does. And what that lamb provides is more than adequate, it's more than enough. And Christ is our lamb. Christ is our lamb. The last enemy. Death. Christ says be faithful with the lamb. You sacrifice the lamb and everybody eats of it. And just as Jesus says, you, you must eat of, of my flesh in order to, to gain eternal life. Well, we're not just talking about being healed or recovering from a, a, a drug addiction or alcoholism or some kind of an addiction for six months or eight months or, or five years. We're, we're talking recovering fully forever. Forever. It's possible. Even for you. And he says, take the blood of the lamb. Nothing's to be wasted. Take the blood of the lamb. And you put that on the lentils of your door, around the door frames of the door. And, and, and death won't have the ability to enter into your home. It'll not only protect over you, it'll protect over your family, your friends, your spouse, everyone within your house. Everything good to you, to protect over it. And death won't be able to come in anymore. And being covered in the blood of the Lamb, this is why we want to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We want to be fully immersed in the blood of the Lamb. That ensures our redemption. Ensures our healing. Gives us the strength and the power to overcome our greatest fears. Sometimes our greatest fears, not believing I, I have the strength or, or the ability within me to overcome that, that addiction. And, and Christ will empower you with, with the ability to, to believe you can overcome it. And not only that you can believe it, but that you will. It'll become a reality. And death came in and it destroyed Pharaoh's firstborn and all the firstborns of Egyptians 
And they were crying so loudly. There was not a house within all of Egypt that, that wasn't experiencing a sense of death, of loss. What they lost, what was put to death, was their control over you. You were released from slavery. They lost their power to control you. It's possible. We just gotta be faithful with implementing the teachings and instructions that have come from the Bible. God's teachings, God's words, God's promises. And, and he speaks to them through these people through the word, through these people's experiences, he speaks to us because we're, we're in a state of brokenness right now. We're broken in spirit. Because of the harsh slavery. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and you'll be able to receive the Holy Spirit. And in receiving the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to converse with God, have an experience with God, just as, as Moses did, absent of the Bible, absent of the church, absent of me. Yes, you can have a conversation with God, and he will respond to that conversation. He'll respond to your needs. He'll respond to your weaknesses. He will redeem you. Your goodness and mercy follow me. Your goodness and mercy follow me. You anoint me. The Spirit of God, you anoint me from the top of my head down to my feet. My cup overflows with your love. Your goodness and mercy follow me. Your goodness and mercy follow